Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am very sorry for this technical delay, but inshallah we will not delay any further. I want to thank uh, the Rahma Foundation, the Jannah Institute, and all of the organizers behind the scenes, uh, everyone who made this event or, uh, possible, and all of you, of course, for being here. I am so excited <laughs> to see this many people, mashallah. Uh, it's been a long time, but alhamdulillah. Thank you for coming out. I know some of you have driven from really far to be here. And we're just so honored, and we've been really anticipating this uh, day. So inshallah, with that said, I invite you to join me on this discussion on one of the four, of course, perfect women, but also just an extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinary saintly uh, woman that I think all of us, once we know more about her story, inshallah, can really relate to. Sometimes when we read stories of people in the past, it, it just seems so far, you know, the distance between us and them and our experiences, that it's hard to feel that they're relatable. But mashallah, as the beautiful verses that our beloved Ustada recited, and we didn't plan, she, we didn't coordinate it, but she recited the very verses that I really wanted you to know of and hear of about our beloved, uh, you know, sister, mother, uh, woman, perfect uh, woman, uh, Asya here. She recited those verses, mashallah, but we're, um, let's go ahead and learn more about her and why she is who she is, the faithful, forbearing, and fearless. Bismillah. So again, uh, again, as the verses that were recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he introduces, you know, pe people to us in the Quran in this momentous way, right, to say that he's given us certain examples, we really have to pay attention because it, there's something coming basically, right? So when he says to us, he has given examples uh, for the believers in Fir'aun's wife, that's for all of us, but also for our male counterparts to learn from, to learn from her as an example for all of us, right? And of course, it's a much longer verse as was recited, but I wanted to point that out. Allah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ also mentions, of course, Asya specifically. So he, in addition to the other three perfect women, says her name. And this also should warrant for all of us to, you know, respond to, to, to I want to know more about her. If he mentioned her, of course, Allah mentioned her. Who is she? I want to know, right? So he says here, the best of women among the people of paradise, already given paradise, are Khadija bint Khuwaylid, Fatima bint Muhammad, Maryam bint Imran, and Asiya bint Muzahim, the wife of Pharaoh. And that distinguishing, you know, mention here of who she is is also really important, as we will now find out. So the reality is we don't have that much biographical information about her, but what we do know is still pretty impressive, subhanAllah. We know that she came from a very regal, royal, very prestigious, noble, wealthy family. So she came from wealth before she was Pharaoh's wife. And she was also known for her exceptional beauty, so she was known to be quite beautiful. And of course, this was an arranged marriage. I mean, we're talking about, you know, people who were in the world of, you know, ancient politics. So she, she's, this was not something that, you know, was a love marriage, certainly. It was an arranged marriage. Um, she was also known in, as just in general, of one of her beautiful defining qualities was her generosity. So very generous woman. And, um, Something that, again, many of us here maybe relate to, she experienced infertility. You know, let's just break it down in language that we understand. She was actually, she went through that. She was, first of all, married to someone who she didn't, um, who Allah knows, you know, whether or not it was her choice. We don't know, but we know that it was an arranged marriage. So maybe there's people in this room. Just this morning, by Allah, I got a message from someone in response to my recent stories on Instagram who, um, you know, she was just, letting, you know, her heart, she found comfort in the post, but she shared with me that she was forced into a marriage and she is miserable. Uh, so there are women amongst us, maybe in our own family, in our own friends groups, that this is their experience, this was her experience, where she was married to clearly not a very good person. We know who Pharaoh was. He was the worst of human beings. But then on top of that, on top of that, she had the second trial and tribulation of not having an escape, right? Because for many women, and again, those of us who work with women in our community, we know that when you're married to someone you're incompatible with or you don't click with, the, the silver lining or the consolation is that you, if you have children from that person, that you can focus your love and your heart and your intentions towards that child. Um, and subhanAllah, you know, that's some, for many women, that's, that's what helps them. It helps them to endure. 
So she didn't have that. She didn't even have children to help her to cope with her reality. And we have to think about the level of, um, you know, just the, the, the privacy, the, 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 the small circle that is afforded to people who are of this, you know, stature. You know, she's a queen. It's not like she has besties that she can go and hang out with. So she's a limited circle. Who knows if she was even near, closer, had her family ac ac you know, accessible. She doesn't have a child, and then she has to witness her husband, who is a horrible, horrible tyrant, you know, persecute, torture, do horrific, horrific crimes. And she doesn't have any means of escape. But subhanAllah, what did she have? Of course, she had her faith, and her faith was a very private matter. It was always very private for her. And so, um, and this is also just to mention here, there's great wisdom in why she wasn't given children, because as our scholars pointed out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want to give Fir'aun a child through this perfect woman. So it was really about her, subhanAllah. Even though she suffered that, it was really, she was too good to have his children, subhanAllah. Um, more about her that we know. So one day, she is with her maidservants at the Nile River. And you just got to put yourself at this scene. This is why I like visual sort of presentations. So I want you guys to read along, but I want you also to visualize. I want you to visualize you're in this predicament. You know, you're just alone. You're probably very lonely, very isolated. But you have some moments of, of you know, maybe some relief, some escape. You're at the Nile. You're looking at this vastness. I've never been to the Nile. May Allah take us all there if you've never been, um, if we've never been. But inshallah, she's in this amazing place with her servants, and then behold, she sees this crate box, it's, it's described in different ways, with a baby floating. Again, just think it's like the, the, the one thing you've wanted perhaps your whole life, or this thing that you've pined for, that Allah subhanahu is now giving to you, and it's floating. So of course, she gets the baby out of the water with, her, with the help of her servants. And she wants this baby. She fell, the scholars again described it, she fell in love with this infant. She fell in love with it. And that's just, again, the natural disposition of women. We, Allah has created us with that. We have the womb, right? And this is why we are deeply connected with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, because it's the same root word as rahim, the womb, whether you have a child or not. Right? Whether you are, whether you bear children or not, you are tied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that many people are not. Half of our, you know, the, the creation is not. So think about that deeply. But here, she falls in love with this baby and she knows what she wants. She wants to keep this baby. This baby is hers. So she goes and she convinces Fir'aun to allow them to keep it. At that point, this, if you, the history is also important to mention because Fir'aun, of course, he had uh, visited a fortune teller who told him that someone from amongst his nation or in Egypt basically was going to overthrow him. So he enacted the most horrific policy of murdering all male baby boys, literally murdering them. All the, 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 the descriptions are so hard to read because you just kind of, you're like, how, how, how are there people like this who could exist? He had, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call them? Sorry, I'm losing my words. Um, he had midwives that were appointed by him who would, who would find out women who were pregnant and they had to birth them. And then he had his henchmen slay the boys right at the birth in front of the mother. This is how horrific of a monster he was. But he also didn't want to uh, have, you know, a, 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 he didn't want to uh, not have a working class of men because the women couldn't do all of the slave labor. So he came up with this policy which was every other year I'll slay the baby boys. And it just so happened that this baby was born in a year when this policy was enacted. So his mother actually, and the story really does, we do need to include her. She is incredibly, I mean, she's an incredible person and she's so important in this story because it is her faith and the fact that she, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inspired her to maintain her pregnancy secretly, to birth her baby secretly. So again, there's another person involved here that we have to introduce to the story. 
her private midwife. This is why suhbah matters, because when you go through a trial, you want to know that there's someone who can keep those secrets for you, who can be there for you when the whole world seems like they're against you. She had, an, an, Allah brought her an amazing soul who kept her secret when everybody else was ready to sell people, throw them under the bus just to get into the, you know, the, the king's court or just to get ingratiate themselves to him. She kept her secret for nine months, ten months. She birthed that baby with her. Allahu Akbar. And then as she's so terrified, imagine she's terrified to, uh, that they, because they would come in and look and inspect the homes. And she had to nurse this baby, so she was secretly nursing. And there are some stories, that are, uh, you know, uh, explanations that say that she would go and hide the baby, you know, in a forest, put it in a box, tie a rope to it, and keep it on the bank of the river because she lived by the bank. So this was her daily thing. I want you again, for the mothers here, to just imagine this is your reality with your infant your newborn infant, that you have to, you can't keep them on you, right? How many of us have, I mean, I had separation anxiety for a few minutes when people wanted to take my baby from me for a few minutes. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> give it back, give him back. So just to imagine having to do this, but she had to do it. And Allah inspired in her to trust that she would, he would reunite her. And the story is beautiful. Again, as the verses of our dear Ustad that she recited, her daughter also is important. SubhanAllah, her daughter, the mother of Musa's daughter. So this is Musa Ali's sister. She's also important because she's the one who was sent to follow the baby up this path, right? And um, we know the story, right? She's the one who convinced uh, the, the court, uh, you know, uh, Asiya's court to allow her mother to come and nurse the baby because they were testing all these women. Like they wanted a wet nurse, he needs to eat. But Allah prevented him from suckling from all of the women until his own mother came, Allahu Akbar. This is the promise of Allah. So all of these women are so important to note of. We can't just, you know, they're not just in the backdrop like, you know, you have uh, the starring role and then supporting people. No, 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 these are all Allah's, you know, clearly showing us how each one of them is so essential to her story. So she finds this baby, she pleads, and she, uh, she's allowed to, she, he agrees to let her keep uh, Musa. I mean, she doesn't know it's Musa at that time, or that he's a prophet, but she keeps him. She loves him as if he's her own. She takes care of him. She, you know, he has access to everything. He lives a very good life, right? SubhanAllah. And so then what happens? So this is a really important part of the story. Now we're gonna segue a little bit because as he's growing up and you know he becomes the prophet and he starts to teach and he comes with his brother Harun, again, follow the story. He is now, I mean, this is his, his you know, he's a prophet, he has to call people to Allah. People get to, you know, are hearing of, of his message and some people secretly believed, uh, you know, and those who, I mean, there were very few brave souls who would openly mention it, but there was a woman, another woman, essential to the story who is known as the hairdresser or the beautician. Now, she is the beautician from a previous marriage, so Fir'aun's daughter's beautician, right? So it's his daughter from a previous marriage, had this beautician, and one day she was combing uh, Fir'aun's daughter's hair, and the comb fell to the ground, and she had you know, become accustomed to calling on the name of Allah. So you know, sometimes it's reflexive, you know, just bismillah. Alhamdulillah, we say these things. She said, Bismillah. So his daughter, now we have to see the other side, right? So his daughter was, of course, um, suspicious of this. She inquires, do you mean my father? Because what would Firan do? He claimed to be God. So she's, this is how he had the power that he had. He, he would force people to accept that he was a billah a god, or not a god, the god, astaghfirullah. So she's just trying to push, you know, a little bit more to find out who she means. And she asks her directly, um, do you mean my father? And then the hairdresser boldly says, no, my lord and, your, and the lord of your father are the same, Allah. So imagine the strength of this hairdresser. I mean, just think, you know, anybody, I mean, just think about the, 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 the faith and the conviction and the courage it takes to the daughter of the most tyrannical human being on the planet that you're gonna tell her that I don't believe that your father is anything, you know? I believe in another God. So she was clearly someone. 
And so the daughter, his daughter, infuriated, she goes and she tells her father that this is what this woman said. Now, he's a monster. We have to just accept. He's a monster. He's not going to accept this. This is a, a slight. It's an insult to him. He has to make an example out of her. So he basically threatens her, and he orders, again, his henchmen, to go and to fill a pit with boiling copper. Okay? So it's like a flame of copper. Just imagine the scene. And she, he threatens that he is going to not only torture her and kill her, but before that, just to add some more torture to it, he's going to torture or kill her children. And one by one, make her watch. And you have to see the story from all these sides. She just boldly confronted this tyrant, and she's still, she has istiqamah, she's still standing straight. She's not bowing down. So she, all she says is, one request. Can't, I just can't even fathom this type of courage. One request, just please collect my bones and my children's bones. That's all I want. Miraculously, he agreed to her one condition. So one by one, they were thrown in front of her. The last one was her nursing infant. So she actually had a nursing infant. And she... Just imagine, she, just, she wavered for a moment. Like, I can't do this. You know, just that whisper. It's a whisper. This is an infant. And subhanAllah, right, there's four babies who spoke. He was one of them. He says to her, right, he says, Mother, throw me and it's okay because the adab, the punishment of the, of the next world is far worse than anything in this life. The baby spoke. Allah inspired this baby to give his mother the courage. And subhanAllah, both of them perished. Their bodies, their physical bodies. Of course, we know the reality. Now, this story was, I mean, people watched it. This was, you know, something that they gathered to watch. And Asiya, radiallahu anha, she also saw this. It deeply affected her. Really affected her to see this. I mean, it would affect anyone, anyone with decency and humanity. While others were jeering and applauding, he or she was moved by the reality that she's done pretending. She's done masking her true beliefs. She realized up until that point that he, as his wife, what would he do to her? He raped women, he tortured children, he killed people without, with impunity, with no thought. What would he do to her? But in that moment, seeing the faith of this hairdresser and her children perish in front of her, she realized she's done. So she goes up to him and she says to him, right, kefertu bika, right, I, I, I do not believe in you, right? And I don't care what you do to me. You, I, don't, I don't believe in you anymore. You're, you're nothing. I don't believe in you. And I don't care what you do to me. Amentu Rabbi Musa wa Rabbi Harun, Rabbil Alameen. I believe in the Lord of Musa and the Lord of Harun, the Lord of all the worlds. So she, with so much bravery, faced him. She confronted him. And when she said this to him, Right? What happened? Pharaoh, of course, he wasn't you know, going to try to save her. There was no decency, no humanity in this man. So he basically needed to make another example of her. But this time it was going to be much worse because this was personal. This was deep, right? This was a real affront to him. So he basically, again, told his henchmen to take her to the desert right? Take her to the de desert and do what? Strip her. It's a, you know, it's a very horrific story in, in these details, but we need to understand why she is who she is. So we have to honor every detail of her story. She was starved. She was in the sun be with, with this intense heat beating down on her naked body, her arms and legs tied, 
and they were whipping her and torturing her. And then they would take breaks between, you know, they're tired of all that torture, so they need to take a break. And Allah, out of his rahmah, sent the angels to cover her. So she would be covered in those breaks. And at a certain point, she called out to Allah, like, Ya Allah, save me from Fir'aun. I want to be close to you. Show me my place in Jannah, right? Give me my place in Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered her. He answered her and he opened up the skies for her in the middle of this torturous, horrific experience. When she cries out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he opens the skies and she can see her place in Jannah and she starts out of sheer ecstasy and joy at the vision of what is to come. She is smiling because she knows that this is temporary. And he sees her, blind as ever, laughing. And he goes, look at her, she's crazy. And he feels even more, you know, emboldened to continue to torture her. And again, no humanity. This is a diabolical, hum not even a human monster. He orders his men. He's so sick of her in her celebration he wants to pulverize her, basically. So he orders that they throw a boulder onto her body, as if what she has been through wasn't enough. He wants to end it, and he doesn't want to give her the satisfaction anymore. So subhanAllah, in her high of seeing her place in Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took her soul. She was gone. The boulder came. Didn't matter, she was gone. This is Asya, the mother of Musa, السلام, one of the four perfect women. So many lessons that we can take from her story. Here's the, uh, just a quote about her martyrdom that Abu Huraira reported, right? He, again, describing what we just did, summarizing it, that he pinned her down and the angel shaded her, and she made this du'a asking for her home and paradise. And the verse uh, is from Surah Al-Tahrim, I believe, chapter 66, verse 11. Now, the lessons, why this story again, there's so many lessons, Ya Allah, so many lessons. But first I wanted to focus on the examples of the women that I mentioned, because we should know these women. You know, sometimes when we hear these stories, we only, again, focus on the main characters, but the women who are the supporting people who made these things happen are also very key, very key. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed them exactly where they were. So Prophet Musa Islam's mother is essential to her story. His sister is essential to the story. The midwife who delivered him, right? The hairdresser herself, Asya radiallahu Know all of them. See examples in all of them. Take lessons from all of their strength. They all had iman that was not moved. It didn't waver. And they followed exactly the command, the, the inspiration Allah gave them or the direct command, but they had a deep connection. They had a secret. They knew something. And, that, and the beauty of that is that we can all know that thing. We can all know that thing, and I'll get to that in a moment, but know, th know this about them. And then the examples of the weak and the cowardly women, we should also think about, right? The daughter of Fir'aun. So when we're in positions of power, if we're not mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we give, you know, uh, we, we, we take power from false uh, gods, false anybody. There's a lot of characters who assume power, and we don't take our power from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should take heed from that, because you abuse power, and that's exactly what she did. She could have kept the secret, but she didn't. She's a coward. The same with the other wives of uh, the, and the concubines of Fir'aun who stood and watched Asya being tortured. So they were watching. And we know this as women even today. How many of us have heard that sometimes women are our own worst enemies, right? It's like you don't get a lot of, I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the, the sense of, of loyalty that you would expect from your own, sometimes you don't feel that. So just think about that. And she experienced that in the worst situation possible. And then also, what we need to take from the story in general, right? To have firm faith. Look at what firm faith gives you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted, she is, subhanAllah, 
a perfect woman mentioned again directly by him, referenced in the Quran by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here we are in 2021 speaking about her. She is not an insignificant person just because she's not on some, you know, website or, or you know, or popular or, or fa famous or has followers. You know, there's all these ideas of what we think are significant today, but those are all false. She is significant because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet gave her significance. And because of her faith, more, you know, the fact that she had that faith and she was able to stand up to him. So having firm faith in regardless of what you're going through will never and you will never uh, suffer, you will never end up short on the short side of anything if you have firm faith. You may, you may go through difficulty, but we're talking about true suffering, which is in the next life, right? And listen to that inner voice, right? We all have the inner voice, all of us. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have the inner voice and we didn't respond to the inner voice. And that inner voice was, know who you are, know what your purpose is, you know, get your prayers straight, wear hijab, Know that that inner voice isn't just from you. That inner voice was given to you to dial up and listen to before it's too late. Don't just ignore it. Don't skip, you know, put the volume down on that and listen to all the nonsense outside of you, outside of us. Listen to that inner voice because it could be the very inspiration that inspired her and all of the other women that we take our lessons from in this story. And know that your strength and power is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one else, no other human being, not your father, not your mother, not your husband, not your children, not your teacher, nobody. Your power and strength is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created you out of nothing. He gave you existence. He could not, he, he could have chosen not to give you existence. So uh, know that. And then what not to do, never doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never for a moment think that if you do something that you obey, that you follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he will not fulfill your du'as, that he will not answer your call. Never let that shak, that doubt that comes from Iblis, it's from him, enter your heart. Have the highest opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us have more uh, expectation and more confidence in, in hum human beings around us. It's tragic. If we have more confidence in our parents or our, our, our you know, siblings or our spouses, our children, and then we doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to rectify that within our hearts. Why? Human beings make mistakes. Our, our Lord is perfect and he doesn't fail in his promises. So if you're going to accept the promises of someone else and then you wonder, did Allah listen to my du'as? Is he going to answer me? That is shuk from shaitan. Reject that. Don't fate, have, have doubt because as the Prophet ﷺ said, right? I fear but one thing from my ummah, weakness of certainty. So we have to strengthen our, our yaqeen with Allah and never be drawn or seduced by power, wealth, fear. This is a demonic message that is permeating all around our world that calls people to put, uh, you know, to draw, to be seduced by power if, in, a, in a worldly sense, right? So that's wealth, it's money, it's beauty. Right? How many women are just caught up in this, this message of, of you know, focusing so much on the external, to spend hours, thousands of dollars. I mean, I don't have all the statistics. You can read them, the beauty industry, and how much millions of dollars are wasted on women thinking that that's power of their beauty, of their physical body, is what they need to rely on to get ahead, to get up in the work uh, position that they want, to get a husband or, and, and have a marriage. No. Your power is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of that's going to go and it can be taken away from you like that. But if you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will what? That in shakartum, that azidannakum. You show gratitude, I will increase you. He will give you more. But if you give it to other people or falsely attribute it to other things, you're, you're losing constantly. And that's why we have a crisis of misery. Read, and I've referenced this paper again, read the, the, the paradox of declining female happiness. Read it right now, you can do a Google search. Read this paper. Yale just po posted it on their website uh, recently. I didn't see it on Yale before, but it is an, an incredible uh, research paper. Shows over 40 years what is happening with the fact that women have all these opportunities now. We have so much that we can do, but the happiness reporting across every section is pivoting. I mean, it's, it's going down. There, it's a paradox. Researchers are puzzled. Why? Because they were told a lie. You have money, you have marriage, you have children, you have education. You're going to have it all. No, if you have all of that and you don't have Allah, you have nothing. You have nothing. That's the truth. That's the message that we believe. 
So don't be seduced by false gods and false claims of power. And never trust yourself to yourself because the, the, the nafs is the greatest enemy of the human being. That's why we need sahbah. That's why we need to turn to teachers and people who know, who are on the path ahead of us. Alhamdulillah for organizations like Rahma Foundation, like Jannah Institute, like our amazing teachers, our amazing uh, uh, you know, scholars who you will inshallah hear from. Alhamdulillah. And just briefly on this idea of power, because I, I, it really affects me. I think you cannot have a conversation on womanhood without addressing this, because it is always the subject of everything related to women. It's always about comes down to power. This is a quote. We should know this quote. It's from Lord Acton. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Pharaoh is a perfect example. And we're seeing how cor corrupt when people have too much power, what it does. We see it in politics. We see it in homes. There are big tyrants and little tyrants. We see it everywhere. Power without divine uh, assistance, without that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is corruptive. This is a quote I read from a psychology, uh, I think, uh, today article on women and why women are drawn to power. And I thought it was important to mention here because we need to address this within ourselves. If we owned our own power, we would no longer be attracted to powerful persons. We would know that they are just people, just like us, who have the same complexes, psycho-spiritual issues, and the same biological, mental, emotional needs as the rest of us. This is, this is truth talk. So any of the younger sisters here, please, again, if you're getting that message from any member of society, any member of your family, any member of your friends group that tells you that you are basically, until you become married, you you're really, you don't have anything to offer this world, right? This is a message so many of us got. Until you become a wife and a mother, you're irrelevant. That's when your life really starts. Reject that, right? Because those are beautiful aspects of life if Allah wills that for you, but that is not the purpose of our creation. We were not created just to be someone's wife and, and have you know, children and, and have a home and, and sit and shop all day. That's not our, the purpose of our creation or to go work even. So whatever um, you know, you're, you're calling you have, alhamdulillah, it's from Allah that he put that in you, but that is not the purpose of why you were created or why I was created. We were all created for one purpose and one purpose only, which was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is essential. So all of this, you know, again, appeal to try to define yourself according to what you have, the, the, the titles you have, the uh, you know, wealth you have, the possessions you have is false, it's a lie. And that's why you need to know what power truly is. And how do we own our power, you may ask? How do you do that? How do you get to that point? Verily, among the best of faith is that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you wherever you are. This is power. If you have constant awareness and vigilance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you, you are never alone. So when you walk out of this building, you go into your car, you wake up every movement that you have during the day. If you realize Allah is with me in this moment, he's closer to me than my jugular vein. He is always with me. He's never not with me. Then you don't give power to others. You don't uh, lose that sight. You always have that presence of mind. And just to further this point, this is a beautiful story that was related to us from Ibn Abbas. And he was around 13 at the time. So again, imagine being a 13 year old and the Prophet ﷺ tells you this message. He says, one day I was riding a horse right behind the Prophet ﷺ when he said, young man, I will teach you some words. Be mindful of God and he will take care of you. If you think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will think of you. To be a thought in our creator's mind, right? Just to think of that idea that he's thinking of us. Of course, he's always, he has full knowledge, so that's not the same thing. When we talk about this, right? Be mindful of God and he will take care of you. There is that law of reciprocity, right? Be mindful of him and you shall find him at your side. If you ask, ask of God. Don't turn to just anyone. Always think my first protocol, the protocol I have when I have a need is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's with me. He knows my plight. He knows my condition. He knows the solution. Why would I go to anyone else? So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you need help, seek help from him. Know that if the whole world were to gather together in order to help you, that they would not be able to help you except if God had written so. And if the whole world were to gather together in order to harm you, they would not harm you, except if God had written so. The pens have been lifted and the pages are dry. This is how we define our power, being mindful of our Lord. 
The strong believer is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the weak believer. So we need to strengthen and fortify our faith. But there is goodness, alhamdulillah, in both of them. Be eager for what benefits you. What benefits you? Allah. Be kafi. That's it. That's all you need. If you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's more than enough. Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. We don't need anyone outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seek help from Allah and do not become frustrated. Don't become impatient, right? Because shaitan, this is how he destroys faith. This is how he weakens faith. As, as another hadith says, and I don't have it here, but um, the, the summary of it is, is that the believers' du'as are answered until they start to look at the time, basically, and say, you know, oh, it's been, I've been praying for this for a month, a week, a few days, a few hours. Then you, you khalas. As soon as you start putting time constraints on Allah, you're presuming to know what's best for you. Where, 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 where did reliance on Allah, where did tawakkal, where did surrendering, submitting to Allah's will, where did that go? So we don't appoint time frames on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We submit, right? So we submit and don't become impatient, don't become frustrated. And if something befalls you, which it will, life is hard. Life is not meant to be easy. Okay, life is difficult, but that is the design of it. But with Allah, He can give you, as they say, the storm. The storm can be going. He'll help you to find the eye of the storm, that safe refuge so that even though the storm is going, you won't feel the effect of it, right? And don't ever let that word, what if. This is also a huge part of what I see in the suffering of so many of our sisters, what if, right? Low, low mina shaitan. This concept of if I could go back in time and rewrite things, things would be better. And I'll tell you briefly as I close out, and I know I'm going a little over because of the delay. Forgive me, I'll finish up in just a moment, just briefly for those who don't know, some of you know me and you've heard me speak about my story. I've lived so many things that I see in Asiya's story, um, but in particular this idea of you know, not having things go as planned, right? I got married very young with the full intention of having children. I wanted many children. That was my plan for myself. Allah, of course, we plan and he plans and he's the best of planners. He willed it that I married someone who could not give me children. And it was the worst form of infertility where nothing, not even in vitro, could work. So there was no way that I was having children with that person. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. But I did not expect that four years into the marriage. And I'm thinking, okay, I think I'm ready for children. Boom. Nope, no children. Another four years in that marriage. I had to come to grips with this. That I planned something, it didn't go the way I planned, but Allah knows best for me. And alhamdulillah, when you have teachers who remind you of these things, and you have suhbah that remind you of these things, you can endure. And alhamdulillah wa shukurillah, immediately after I left that marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up just like the skies. For Asiya, I could see hope again. And everything changed for me. Within a year of that divorce, I was... Uh, I had my child within a year or a month or so. My first child. I was remarried, obviously. <laughs> I forgot to mention that point. <laughs> but Allah knows best. And alhamdulillah, I can't even remember my previous life. I know I had one, but I really don't remember it. I'm so grateful for that because my life, uh, in, in so many ways, right, when we, again, look back in our trajectory, we, we can sometimes remember the painful moments, but that's one of the mercies of God is that he'll take those memories from you. So alhamdulillah. But with that said, the last and final message, I, I just want to finish these slides because I put a lot of work into this. That's why I was like, I got to get this up here. You decide your path. You decide your priorities. The power that you have is in your choices. All of us have choices to make in our decisions. It's where we, it reflects our power. You decide the lens you, see this, you choose to see this world, right? Your perspective, your worldview, your framing, that's your decision. You decide your choices, your words, your actions, behaviors, your attitudes, reactions. We have to remember we are moral agents. We are responsible for ourselves. You decide the narrative that you live according to. You want to adopt the narrative that's going around in the world that just reduces women to nothing but physical beings that are there at, for, to please everyone else except for themselves okay or you can choose what our faith teaches us which is you have the highest aspirations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the narrative that we should all be living according to and you decide the value of your life your life means something you are important you were meant to be here every single one of you Allah loves you Allah loves you remember that and then the final and last message here is another beautiful example. The believer is what? That of a fresh tender plant from whatever direction the wind comes it bends but then the wind 
When the wind becomes quiet, it becomes straight again. This is how we are. Life is going to hit you. It's going to come at you this way and that way. You bend with it. You go with it. You don't resist the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when all of it settles, you're firm. That's faith, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.